objective at Verdun passed to the French. And Germany's technical advantages were short-lived. Throughout the war, new ideas were quickly picked up by the other side. All our inventions seem to turn like evil spirits against us, like a monster destroying itself. Amid these terrible scenes of destruction, the idea of ever returning home seems indescribably glorious. Please look after yourself and our home, your soul and your body and all that is mine. Franz Mark was killed later that day. Finally, on the 24th of October, 1916, the French recaptured Fort Dourmont. Verdun was saved. At last, the time has come, and we set off to conquer the enemy positions. They don't offer any resistance, and the few men who are still alive come out of their holes crying, Camarade! The battlefield of Verdun has a different atmosphere from any other I was ever on. Its horrors are also greater. But there's a feeling of intense satisfaction. It was at Verdun that the French people found themselves again and emerged from the clouds which have hung over them since their defeat by the Germans in 1870. France had learned a string of lessons at Verdun about artillery, new weapons, logistics and manpower. but at a cost of over a third of a million casualties. German casualties were nearly as high, but Germany, fighting alone in the West and with weak allies on other fronts, could not endure losses on this scale. She would not launch another major offensive on the Western Front until 1918. One can look for miles and see no human beings. But in those miles of country lurk, it seems, thousands of men, planning against each other perpetually some new device of death. Never showing themselves, they launch at each other bullet, bomb, aerial torpedo and shell. Unlike previous wars, the fighting on the Western Front was unceasing. Somewhere down the line, there was always a gun firing a man falling. But for the troops of both sides, life was not always unrelenting warfare. During 1916, the average British soldier spent 100 days at the front. For the remainder, he was in reserve, on work detail, resting, or on leave. And over the 500-mile front, some sectors were easier than others. Even busy ones had their lulls. One day, British General Lord Edward Gleichen visited the front line. When going round the trenches, I asked a man whether he had had any shots at the Germans. He responded that there was an elderly gentleman with a bald head and long beard who often showed himself over the parapet. Well, why didn't you shoot him? Shoot him, said the man. Why, Lord bless you, sir, he's never done me no harm. A shocking example of live and let live. Live and let live was a pervasive phenomenon on both sides of accommodation with the enemy. It arose because in quiet times and in quiet lines, men were learning to adapt to war 
and to adapt war to them. We sometimes got out of the trench into the tall grass behind, which the sun had dried, and enjoyed a warm indolence with a book. Not infantry training, I think. The war seemed to have forgotten us in that placid sector. Quand les gosses viennent sur Paris, puis à la cave me mettent à l'abri, se retrouve là en pyjama, un tas de gens assis sur des pliants, le long du mur dans un angle obscur, puis dernièrement un couple étonnant, de bon vieux bourgeois, madame aux avoirs, criez sa flèche toi. Tiens-moi contre moi, tiens-moi contre moi, tiens-moi bien, tiens, tiens, si mon Adrien. I'm with officers and sergeants who are great fun. There's lots of schnapps and wine, and every day we get so drunk we forget whether we're at war or in Civvy Street. <laughs> In my image, there was a piano actually in the trench in the front line, and we had many a good sing-song. I feel great. I have never lived so well, and probably never will again. I have just joined our sports club. This evening, someone got a football. Now we can play football, racing, long jump. Chocolate is the prize, donated by our platoon commander. Life in this sector is gloriously lazy. Weather is perfect, the enemy most peaceful. And there's little to do but lie on one's back and smoke, or write imaginative letters back home. It would be child's play to shell the road behind the enemy's trenches, crowded as it was with ration wagons and water carts, into a blood-stained wilderness. But on the whole, there is silence, after all. If you prevent your enemy from getting his rations, his remedy is simple. He will prevent you from drawing yours. We often see the smoke of the Germans' mealtime fires ascending in blue-grey spirals. It is only common courtesy not to interrupt each other's meals with intermittent missiles of hate. One day while our infantry was cooking, there was a shout from the enemy trench. Could he come and eat too? He was invited over. The Frenchman came and ate and made himself comfortable. And from then on, whenever the Frenchman noticed that food was ready in the German trenches, he came and joined in. Sometimes an officer tried to stir his men into a little action. How about posting a sniper or lobbing over a grenade? We received the following message tied to a stone from the German trenches opposite. We're going to send a 40-pounder. We've been ordered to do this, but we don't want to. It'll come this evening, and we'll blow a whistle first to warn you so that you have time to take cover. All happened as they said it would. The sniper is a very necessary person. 
he serves to remind us that we are at war. Wherever a head or anything resembling a head shows itself, he fires. Were it not for his enthusiasm, both sides would be sitting upon their respective parapets, regarding each other with frank curiosity. And that would never do. British Directive, March 1916. With trench warfare, there is an insidious tendency to lapse into a passive and lethargic attitude against which officers of all ranks have to be on their guard, and the fostering of the offensive spirit calls for incessant attention. Live and Let Live was dependent on the sector and the troops manning it. The Germans didn't like facing the Highland regiments. The British couldn't get along with the Prussians. But some of the other Germans were fine. The soldier Mike gave us some useful hints. It's the Saxons that's across the road, he said, pointing to the enemy lines, which were very silent. They're quiet fellows, the Saxons. They don't want to fight any more than we do. So there's a kind of understanding between us. Don't fire at us, and we'll not fire at you. Live and Let Live did not occur where elite regiments were operating. They had their own ideas about getting at the enemy. Rare footage of a daylight raid by South African troops. The idea was to dominate no man's land. To say to the enemy, it's not no man's land, it's ours. Raids broke up trench routines, brought intelligence from prisoners, encouraged aggression. This, British High Command thought, was the cure for live and let live. Training sessions were organised using elaborate models of the target area. Raiding became compulsory for all regiments, and laggards were...